everyone at Cedar Fork Baptist Church. We're glad to come to you today, but we're also happy to be able to come to <clears throat> countless others throughout our land by means of the YouTube presentation of which we are, have taped and shared for your viewing pleasure. We have folks in <clears throat> Tennessee and North Carolina beyond Cedar Fork area, uh, Texas, uh, Illinois. Illinois, and just probably other places we're not even fully aware of. But we're grateful that the Word of God is going out in this way, and we're grateful that you've chosen to be a part of this experience today. And if you are amongst those with us at Cedar Fork today, we're so thankful that you have your Bibles with you. And I would ask you to turn in your Bibles to the fourth book of the Old Testament, the book of Numbers, right before the book of Deuteronomy. We'll share there in the 10th chapter, verse 29 through 32. As we look to these verses this morning in Numbers chapter 10, verses 29 through 32, we're going to be sharing upon a subject that um, we all have addressed somewhere along the line in our life, and that is simply the peril of playing it safe. <clears throat> now, a few moments ago, I looked up the definition that Webster has for the word peril. He describes peril as something that is danger attached to it along that line of thought as we go along and do the things that we do in life. Um, as a child growing up, I heard many times people would say to me, you need to be careful and play it safe. Well, I didn't fully understand all they were saying because when you're young, you think you're going to live forever, nothing's going to harm you, and you go along. And I'm just grateful today that God's mercy and grace um, stood over me and protected me in ways that I didn't have enough sense to protect myself for. And I'm so grateful today that he's done the same thing for you and he hopefully will continue to do so as we yield our lives to him. But let's look now to the book of Numbers. As I said, that's the fourth book of the Old Testament, right before Deuteronomy, uh, the four or five books of the law. And look in chapter 10 there, and we read this passage, beginning in verse 29. Now Moses said to Hobab, the son of Ruel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, We are setting out for the place of which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us, and we will treat you well. For the Lord has promised good things to Israel. And he said to him, I will not go, but I will depart to my own land and to my relatives. So Moses said, Please do not leave. Inasmuch as you know how we are to camp in the wilderness, and you can be our eyes. And it shall be, if you go with us, indeed it shall be, that whatever good the Lord will do to us, the same will he do to you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we ask God's blessings upon his word and upon the time that we'll spend together today. Father, I thank you that we can look to this passage of old, although it's many, many years back. The principles and truths of which we read and will see together today uh, so truly make it clear to us of the perils of playing it safe. May we, Father, move beyond the place of Hobab and to the place that you'd have us to be and that the place you want us to be in our journey today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, <clears throat> when we go about in life and we sometimes look at the things about playing it safe. Uh, I think many times we do go about and tempt some things because we think we can beat the odds. And that's the peril of one of the things of which we share here. And there's times when playing it safe results in losing out. An example of that, of course, is found in the rich young ruler in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. You remember there in those verses, and he came to Jesus there in verse 17. And he said to Jesus, as we read beginning of verse 17, Now as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Boy, he was feeling good now. Teacher, I have all these things have I kept from my youth. And then Jesus said something that rang his bell that he just could not take. 
Then Jesus, looking on him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross and follow me. But look at that next verse, in verse 22 of Mark chapter 10. But he was sad at this word, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Here was an individual who had the opportunity to enjoy eternal life, to enjoy the blessings of Jesus on his life. But he, like Hobab, in a scripture we read in Numbers chapter 10 a moment ago, went away sad. He went away sad because he failed to do what Jesus had called upon him to do in the process of doing so. So let's look a little bit closer at Hobab. The setting of which we find this passage being written is, is as Moses and the children of Israel had been at Mount Sinai for a year now. And there in that time of preparation, God had established a covenant relationship with them. And there during that time as well, uh, God established through Moses uh, institutions vital to that relationship. Those included the law that was given there on Mount Sinai and the priesthood of, uh, of the setting up of the priesthood. The tabernacle, of course, was established and shared there and the sacrificial system was all put in place. Now, all of these things have happened and now God is saying it's time to move on. And so before Moses and the children of Israel begin to make their move toward the promised land, the land of Canaan, he extends an invitation to his father-in-law, Hobab. Now there's much significance to this invitation as we will see through the message this, today. It's not just a message, an invitation to break the boredom of life by taking a trip. Uh, not many trips being taken now with COVID-19 going on in our lives or other issues that are hindering us from being able to do so. But he was going to be able to share all that God was going to do because this was a covenant relationship, now God is in charge of their destiny. And because God is in charge of their destiny, Moses is saying to Hobab, he says, Hobab, I'm inviting you to share in God's purpose for Israel. And as God blesses Israel, he will bless you. As I think about this, I think as well about the importance of church membership. Many people treat church membership as unimportant and they don't need the church in their life and go on in these things in life. Others treat it as too casually as if it's not very important. But I want to remind you that the church is a living organism through which God has chosen to do His work. Jesus, you remember, said, "In the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so being a part of the church, and I, I can't emphasize this enough today, means we have a great part in the great purpose of God in this world that we live in. And so let's look at Hobab's response to the invitation that Moses gave him. Once again, if you'll look in verse 30 of chapter 10 of Numbers, it says, And he said to him, I will not go, but I will depart to my own land and to my relatives. In doing so, although he didn't use these words, we see Hobab saying, I'm going to take the peril of playing it safe. And I can hear Hobab saying at least three different things in his refusal here uh, to go with Moses and the people of Israel. And in looking at these three things this morning, we can uncover, if you will, or discover a hidden agenda behind the response of which Hobab made. You see, most people have an agenda in their life and that affects their decisions of which they make and why they do the things of which they do and why they don't do the things of which they do. So the first thing I want us to see about Hobab's uh, response was he was saying, in essence, this. I, he wasn't going because, first of all, I will have to change. Now, we have to agree. Hobab was right. If he made this move, it would require a major change in his life for sure. He would be required to leave the familiar and the known of which he had known for so many years 
for our area that was strange in so many other ways and unknown in so many other ways. And so he said no. <clears throat> and in saying no, he played it safe by refusing the invitation of which Moses had extended to him. I want to say to us this morning, you say Hobab was obeyed many years ago and Moses spoke directly to him, but God also speaks to us. God speaks to us and when he extends the call, it always mandates a change. If you're a Christian this morning, you're a Christian because you was willing to lay aside your old life and your sinful life and lay it at the foot of the cross and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and promise to live for Him and do what you could for Him the best that you possibly could do. You see, God's call always mandates the change. For Abraham, you remember there, he had to leave Haran to go to Canaan. And you remember that Moses was up in the sharing there in the burning bush experience and, and God spoke to him there after being 40 years away from Egypt. And said, Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt and I want you to lead my people free from the bondage. And here he is now, 80 years old. And saying, God, you must, I don't understand that, but if that's what you want, after some deliberation, he decided to go. Think about those fishermen brothers, James and John. As Jesus called them to be his disciples, it required a change for them. They would have to change a, a lifestyle, a thing that was all of their life. You think about Saul, uh, later known as the Apostle Paul, as he met Jesus on the Damascus Road there. Tremendous change for him. But what about us? Yes, it requires a change for us as well. But sadly, and I say that word sadly, I can't emphasize it enough because I may be speaking to somebody today who sadly want like Hobab to play it safe and not follow the direction the Lord wants you to go today. I realize that attempting something new is frightening. I remember when churches would call and see if I'd be interested in moving, especially while we were still in our first pastorate. I felt like that was going to be a pastorate that I would retire from. After 13 years, of course, God had other plans in our mind, and we went to Bear Creek and served there for almost 10 years, and later to Salem and Sneeds Ferry for 11 years and then association for another six years and, and now doing the work in which we're doing now and helping churches during the interim time. But I want to say to you that those moves were not without having to make some changes. And sometimes they were frightening. We were going into situations we did not know, people whom we did not know, and challenges which we had not perhaps faced before. You say, well, did you ever want to play it safe? I certainly did. But God, if it's in God's will, He'll not let you rest until you come in obedience to Him and do the things that He wants you to do. You see, I realize today that you may be fearful of change that might be happening in your life right now. And you, like the rich young ruler, wants to hold on to things as they are. But I would remind us this morning, as I've had to remind myself so many times since that day as a 10-year-old boy at North Benton Baptist Church. Launching out in faith is a fearful exercise because in doing so, we're attempting to do something new that is frightening. Something we've never done before, probably. And so we want to play it safe. But let me tell you, my friend, if you're here this morning, you're listening to what I'm saying now, and I hope that you are, playing it safe in this matter, in this situation, you miss out on the very best that God has in store for you. I wouldn't trade how God has moved in our lives the past many years, and I'm so grateful that Norma has felt that call and has followed. And many times I know she didn't want to go as far as we went in places, but we're grateful that even then, we said, all right, Lord, if this is your will, then we'll go. Think of what Abraham would have missed if he had stayed there in Haran. Think of what Moses would have missed if he'd stayed there on the mountain shepherding the sheep of his father-in-law. Think of those fishermen and all they would miss of being with Jesus for those three and a half years. 
Think of Saul. They would have all missed so much because they had played it safe and because they refused to change. Now, God's Holy Spirit may be working in your life today in some way as, as you share it and as you're thinking about it. God is saying, I've got something for you, but it's going to require some change in your life. And are you going to be willing to do it by faith? You say, I can't see what God wants me to do. Well, that's what faith is. Faith is some things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. If you can see it, you don't need to have faith. So Hobab says, the first thing, I'm not going to go with you, Moses, because I will have to change. Are you saying that today? I also hear Hobab saying, secondly of all, Moses, I'm not going to go with you because I might fail. You see, this invitation of which Moses was extending to Hobab involved a responsibility. So Moses said, please, in verse 31, please do not leave inasmuch as you know how we are to the camp in the wilderness and you can be our eyes. Hobab, you can lead us and we can avoid many of the dangers that lay out there because we've not been in that land, but you've been there. You know what it is. But Hobab didn't want that responsibility. And why didn't he want that responsibility? Well, we can't talk to Hobab personally this morning, but I can say to you this. I think if we could, he might say something like this. I might fail, and therefore I'm going to play it safe and as a result of that, I'm not even going to try at all. You see, we're living in a day and a time which is unlike any other time that I've ever lived in my lifetime, to say the least. But I believe we're living in a day and a time if the Ten Commandments were to be written again, we would impress upon God to write in those Ten Commandments, and this would what it would be, Thou shalt not fail. We, we, none of us like failure. Failure is not something that we set out to in, engage in and accomplish. Many live by the rule, and that is success at all cost. Um, the fact of the matter is, no one succeeds all the time. I don't care who you are, how much education you got, how much uh, experience you have in your life, all of us have failed at one time or another. And probabilities, let me bust your bubble a little bit now, you will fail again and I will fail again. All of us will fail at something in some way. But if we will examine the success of every great achiever, we will discover and that we will include a chapter on failure in each of their lives, or maybe many chapters of failure in their lives, and I like what Thomas Edison said after the many failures and said, you know, that's just one more way that we know not to do it in, 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 in developing the light bulb and things along that nature. But those who have been great successes in life have succeeded in spite of their failures. The story is told of Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, and if things keep going where they are, I guess all the monuments of our land will be torn down, especially if it has anything to do with the Civil War. But Ulysses S. Grant, you remember, was about to make a major decision. Fate, a thousand of his soldiers lay at hand. And one of his people under him said, Are you sure that you are right? Are you sure that this is the right decision that you need to make, General? And General Grant said, no, I'm not sure. To that brought the response, then how can you make the decision? To which Grant responded, there is, yes, a great risk, as you pointed out. But the greatest tragedy is indecision. I would like to, no, I don't want to know. I'm glad God never has shown me. The number of people down through the years that when I would preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and they would hear it and the Holy Spirit would convict their hearts and their lives and be drawing them to give their life to Jesus and yet they wouldn't do it. 
And many of them would say to me, Preacher, I came that close to coming forward today. To which I would respond, You might as well have been a hundred miles because that close is not close enough. And I would encourage them to take that next step of faith right there without any doubt in my mind that God would hear them just as much then as He would otherwise. What are we trying to say here? I think we're saying, in essence, the greatest failure is not to try at all. I think back on my own life and wonder of the many things that I would not have experienced had I not tried. And I think about those that I might have experienced, but I didn't try as well. Said there was three things. The third thing I want you to see here, we could probably hear Hobab saying, it's too late, Moses. The bulk of my life is behind me. It's too late to begin a new venture, particularly one of the magnitude of which you're offering me today. And so what does this do? It brings us face to face with the issues of age and aging. And I say age and aging because you must separate the two. One automatically happens, and the other is a result of choice. I'm a year older today than I was a year ago this day because that's just the way it is. Time has passed. I can't change that. And from where I was last year this time to where I'm at today, I wouldn't want to change it to go back to that. But aging, I believe, is many times a result of choice. Someone said one time, and I do not know who it was, uh, said this, we don't stop doing things because we get older. We get older because we stop doing. Well, admittedly, there's some qualifications to that statement. I like to tell people, I can do everything that I did when I was younger. It only takes me a little longer to do it. But that in itself isn't even a true statement. I can't run around the house. I can't play baseball. I can't squat behind the batter and catch a baseball game like I did so many years ago, and which I had so much joy in doing so. No, we can't stop getting older. But acting older is a choice that we make. You want to know how to stay young? Some of the youngest people I know are the oldest people I know. And I say that because they've stayed young at heart by keeping a vision for tomorrow. They're not looking back on yesterday or years ago, although they're thankful for each one that they've had. But Hobab, he wanted to look back on what had been. He wasn't ready for new adventure. He wasn't ready for new challenges. And he missed out on a great venture in his life. We can't find anywhere in the scriptures, at least that I can find, that Hobab ever changed his mind and went with Moses. As we look upon the roll calls of those faithful ones in Hebrews and other places in the Bible, of course we see Moses there, we see many others there along the line. But you'll never read in one of those great honor rolls of faith, the name Hobab. How sad it is he played it safe and he missed out. How sad it was and is to be a loser when he could have been a winner. How sad it is for you listening to me today. God has something wonderful planned and prepared for you. But like Hobab, you said, no, I'm going to play it safe. I'm going to keep on going the way I've been going. You see, there have been Hobabs throughout history. You can find them today. And as you look around and you think about your own life and the lives of others, the difference between being a loser instead of a winner is not in the terms of our ability but our availability. 
not in terms of our failures, but our opportunities to claim those opportunities that God places in our life. I know that you, like I in school years ago, don't know if they're still using it now, but they did back in our day. Whittier wrote these words in Maud Muller. For all the sad words of tongue and or pen, the saddest are these, it might have been. Hmm. So we look at Hobab. He wanted to play it safe. He didn't want to change. He said it was too late. And I want to say to you in closing today that sometimes playing it safe is certainly good advice. Think of the situations, though, that you lost out because you played it safe. Think of those times of which you felt that God was so moving in your heart and your life to do a certain thing, and you didn't do it, and you no longer feel the call to that thing. Think how differently life would have been for Abraham. Think how differently it would have been for Moses and, and, and the disciples and, and, and Paul or Saul there as it went about. There was a challenge in each of those situations. I ask you this morning, is there a challenge you haven't accepted that God has laid out before you? Is there an opportunity that you haven't maximized to the fullest today? And you would say, been saying in your heart and your life, if I only had one more chance, I wouldn't make the decision I made back then. Well, good news this morning in this. There is still time. As long as you're still breathing, there's still time. And I would encourage you not to be a hobab, and experience the peril of playing it safe. But step out in faith, believing that God will be there with you. And He will guide you, and He will save you, and He will keep you, and make you whole in all the things that you need in your life. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you today that uh, you've reserved these words for us down so many years ago. And I pray, Lord, that those who are hearing this message will not... Uh, be like Hobab and miss the blessings that you've got in store because they want to play it safe. Help us, Lord, to reach out in areas we've not been before and do things that we've not done before. Not because we want to do them, but because, Lord, you've laid them before us to do. And so, Father, I pray for those who are lost today, wherever they might be in this time, that they might give their heart and their soul to Jesus Christ. And Lord, if they need to talk to somebody, they can give us a call. They can talk to anybody here in the church or anybody that they love and they know that knows Jesus Christ. And their life can be different too. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So I say this morning, once again, don't miss out on what God's got in store for you. And I look forward to coming together and to being with you next week and perhaps hearing through this week things that God has done in your life because you refuse to play it safe. And if you'll join us next Sunday morning, I'm going to be preaching on this subject. <clears throat> when not to pray. Now, I know that you've probably never heard a sermon like that before, but I'm going to preach on next Sunday morning on when not to pray, and the text is found in Exodus chapter 14, verse 15. Join us then, and until then, may God bless you.